Hello, my name is David Friedland and I'm with Texas Instruments. Welcome back to the online SysBIOS training workshop. In this portion, we'll be discussing semaphores. But please note that there is also a separate module on SysBIOS tasks. And if you're unfamiliar with task threads, you should view that one before proceeding with this module. So we have already talked a bit about semaphores and how tasks use them to block while waiting for an event to occur or a resource to become available. There are other SysBIOS API calls that a task can pend on, such as mailbox pend, but ultimately they all use the semaphore module to do this. Each semaphore that is created will always have a count associated with it, and this count will always be zero or greater. The two basic calls that change or modify this count are semaphore pend and semaphore post. Semaphore post increments the count and semaphore pend decrements the count. Here are a few examples. In this case, I have created a semaphore called mysem and it has a count of zero. Calling semaphore post will increase its count to one. In the next example, I call semaphore pend. The count of my sem decrements back to zero. I should mention here that there are actually two broad classes of semaphores, counting and binary. Binary semaphores can only have a count of either zero or one. Counting semaphores can have a count of any number of zero or greater. When a semaphore is created, one of the parameters passed to the create call is the semaphore mode, which says which one of these two types of semaphores is being created. In the next example, I have a semaphore that has a count of one. If this is a counting semaphore, calling semaphore post will increment the value from one to two. However, if this was a binary semaphore, calling semaphore post on a semaphore with a value of one will not change the count. Now let's take a look at how semaphores can be used to block a task. In the simplest case, we have a task that is running and in that task function, it makes the API call semaphore pend on the mysem semaphore. Because mysem has a count of zero, the call to semaphore pend will cause the scheduler to move this task to the block state, and at this point, some other thread will start to execute. Here is an example where the task is running and calls semaphore pend, just like in the last example. But in this case, the count of mysem, which is obviously a counting semaphore and not a binary semaphore, is two. So the call to semaphore pen decrements the semaphore's count from two to one. But since the count is not zero, the task does not block. Only pending on a semaphore with a count of zero will cause the task to block. Now let's see how a task can unblock. Here we see that we have two tasks, a low priority task that is in the running state and a high priority task that is blocked on a semaphore pend call. The running low priority task will call semaphore post on the semaphore. At that instant, the BIOS scheduler will make the high priority task ready to run, and since it is the highest priority thread at that point, it will actually start running. Note that the count of the semaphore is still zero. That's because although semaphore post was called the high priority task immediately completed its semaphore pend call, which took the value of the semaphore back to zero. Finally, I'm going to give a slightly more complex example. In this case, we have two different tasks that are both blocked because they are pending on the same semaphore. This is okay. Multiple tasks can all pend on the same semaphore. Because the higher priority tasks are blocked, it is my lowest priority task that is running, and it, in turn, makes a call to semaphore post. As soon as it does so, this allows one of the tasks, but only one of the tasks, to unblock and be made ready to run. The scheduler will simply pick the first task in its queue to unblock first, and, as in the previous example, the semaphore value stays at zero. 
Note here that I said that the first task in the queue is the first to unblock, which means the first task that blocked will be the first one that is made ready to run as soon as the semaphore is posted. In this example, even though one of the block tasks has a higher priority than the other, it is not necessarily the one that is made ready to run. This is a little tricky and non-intuitive. To give you a more concrete demonstration of how a binary semaphore is used, I'm going to walk through this very short code excerpt. The main idea here is that a binary semaphore can be used to protect a critical resource or section. And by critical, I mean something that more than one process or thread will want to access. And we need to make sure that only one accesses it at any given instant in time. A good analogy for this are automobiles driving on a road. Each auto represents an independent task, and as long as all the tasks are driving on their own roads, there won't be a problem. But if the roads cross, that intersection is a critical section, and only one car can be allowed in at any one time, or disaster will strike. Roads have stoplights to protect critical sections, but in programming, we use binary semaphores to do the same thing. In this code example, we have two tasks running concurrently, but at different priorities. When they are created, the low priority task will be made ready to run, and the high priority task will start executing. It enters an infinite loop and needs to perform an operation on a critical resource, a global variable, that is shared between the two tasks. So before operating on the resource, the task first pens on a semaphore and then posts the semaphore when it's done. When the high priority task goes to sleep for several milliseconds, the low priority task gets its chance to run and operate on the resource, also bracketing the operation with a pend and a post. When the high priority task wakes back up, it will immediately pend on the semaphore again. If the low priority task was interrupted while in the critical section, this pend will make the high priority task block, allowing the low priority task to finish the operation. As soon as the low priority task posts the semaphore, the high priority task will resume running. To explain further about how counting semaphores are used, I'm going to use yet another analogy. Imagine a restaurant with a limited number of tables, in this case four, and quite a few more customers than that. Each one of these customers are like independent tasks, and each of those tables represents a resource that a customer wants to take for some period of time. To avoid the disaster of having multiple customers trying to sit at a single table, the restaurant has a maitre d'. The maitre d' is like a semaphore, and it referees how the resources are taken and given back up. Because we have four tables, the program will initialize the semaphore to a count of four. As each customer task wants a table, it will perform a semaphore pend call, and each of those calls will decrement the semaphore's count. While tables are available, the semaphore count is greater than zero, and the pend calls will simply fall through, allowing the task to keep executing. But once all the tables are full, the semaphore count is zero, and any more tasks calling semaphore pend will block on that call. Once a customer task is done with the table, it performs a semaphore post, incrementing the semaphore's count and allowing the next block task to run so that it can grab the resource for its own use. Note that even though we have a multitude of tasks and four resources, all the arbitration can be done with a single counting semaphore. Also note how important it is that the semaphore operations are atomic. This means that the task cannot be interrupted while the semaphore is in the midst of getting posted or pended, so the operation stays safe and coherent. Thanks for listening to this portion of the SysBIOS online training. I hope it proved helpful. Please note that SysBIOS is included as a component to CoComposer Studio. However, if you would like to download SysBIOS as a standalone product, you can go to the web page listed here. Also, if you have any questions about using SysBIOS, or if you would like to make suggestions on how to improve this training series, please post a comment to the TIE2E forums BIOS page at the web address shown here.
there are some very knowledgeable developers and users of SysBIOS who might be able to help you out. Good luck with your upcoming software development.